Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today in the Dungeon Dive, we are going to take a look at Apocrypha Adventure Card Game. This game was voted on by Dungeon Dive patrons for me to cover in the month of November. If you'd like to have more of a say in some of the games and some of the things I cover on the channel, uh, please join the Dungeon Dive Patreon. It really does help a lot. Helps keep this channel funded and going with new things to show. Apocrypha is a game designed by Mike Selinker. Mike Selinker is kind of a legendary figure in the tabletop gaming space. He has worked for companies like TSR and WotC and Avalon Hill. He's worked on and designed a whole bunch of games and puzzles and written for a whole mess of different publications. Mike Selinker was uh, one of the main or the main designer of the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Apocrypha was actually in development before that game. Paizo uh, got wind of, caught wind of this game, and then they wanted the Pathfinder version made. So the company uh, put Apocrypha kind of on the back burner, and then they resurrected it later through a big uh, Kickstarter, and then this actually came out after Pathfinder. So Apocrypha, the adventure card game, is an adventure card game. It's an adventure game that you uh, played only with a deck of cards and some dice. In this game, players will take on the role of heroes called saints, and a party of saints is called a choir. Saints are normal human beings who have been uh, blessed and cursed with the ability to see beyond the veil of reality and see the world as it really is a dark and twisted place overrun with nasty creatures and these kind of evil demigod-like beings called Novum who want nothing more than to destroy humanity and the world. So it's up to the saints, it's up to the choir of saints to stop the Novum and prevent the impending apocalypse. Thematically, Apocrypha reminds me of bits and pieces of the Persona video games mixed in with a defunct MMO called Secret World and maybe some elements from ether fields and also elements from television shows like Supernatural, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and X-Files. If you like any of those things and you haven't checked this game out, there's a good chance that you might like Apocrypha. I think this game is going to be kind of re-evaluated uh, maybe it's going through in a, a re-evaluation period right now because this game is on clearance. It's being cleared out on the Lone Sharks uh, website. Uh, as of the middle of November of 2023, you can still get an incredible deal on a bundle. And that's how I bought this game just a about a month ago. You get the full base game called The World. You get the two big box expansions called The Flesh and The Devil. You also get a small expansion called the hybrids and you uh, additionally, you get some promo cards and some PDF books that have additional material for the game. And you get all of that for only about $60. And I know they still have some bundles left. And so I think some people are going to be getting this game new in 2023 and coming to it with maybe a somewhat different perspective than the people who originally kickstarted it. Uh, had. So I think this game was actually kind of doomed by its Kickstarter release. This is a game that would have greatly benefited from a smaller initial retail release with a long tail. You know, that's something we talk about a lot on the channel. Even the best made games that are available on crowdfunding websites, they come and go really quickly because people who buy games through crowdfunding typically move on from one game to the next uh, with all of the hype and all of the excitement for a game actually coming before the game is actually in hands. This game suffered from a major stumbling block, and that was learning and understanding the game out of the box. So a lot of people got all of their stuff from Kickstarter and they ran into that big brick wall and promptly shelved and forgot about the game. So if this game was allowed to come out at retail with a smaller initial release and allowed an organic buildup of fans and material over time with new releases peppered and sprinkled throughout the years, 
as the designer and the publisher fostered the learning experience and listened to the community over time, I think we'd still be talking about this game in the same way that people talk about the Arkham Horror LCG available now. But that's not what happened. It was released all at once. It made a lot of people mad because it's a real pain in the ass to learn. And now the game is basically on clearance through the publisher's website. But I think it is a good time to kind of take a look at the game and reevaluate the game. There's a really good blog post that Mike Selinkert wrote on his blog, uh, kind of about the beginnings of this game, what inspired the game. And I wanted to read a little bit from that blog post. Uh, Mike Selinkert says, Apocrypha is about scary things, demons and shadows and razor blades and apples. Those things scare me, but one thing scares me a whole lot more, and that fear inspired the fragment mechanic. We'll talk a little bit about the fragment mechanic. Now back to the blog. Because I've been thinking a lot about Alzheimer's disease. Now, before anyone tears the internet down, this game is not about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the least fun thing in the world, and Apocrypha is supposed to be fun. So you won't see any mention of Alzheimer's in the game, because it's not about that. But the concept of losing control of my brain frightens me more than anything. I need my brain. Stuff that comes out of it not only makes sure I can survive, but helps give my teammates projects to work on and my clients things to publish and our fans fun things to play and read and solve. If I lose control of my brain, I don't get to do that anymore. Alzheimer's destroys that possibility. It rips apart your short-term memory first, and then it takes everything else away piece by piece. It disassembles what you know, and then it disassembles you. And he goes on in the blog to talk about some of cognitive decline that his mother experienced and that he is currently experiencing. So it's a really thoughtful blog post about the, the genesis of Apocrypha, the adventure card game. And I think that word thoughtful is a good word to describe the game. So this video, we're going to be taking a look at what you will get in the base game and the expansion material. We'll talk a little bit about how the game is played. This is not a rules overview because I would be foolish to think I could ever do a rules overview for this game. It's pretty complex, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the game in general and how it's played and kind of my feelings on the game. But we will start with some suggestions on how to learn the game. Because in 2023, people new to Apocrypha should actually have a much better time getting into the game because we have access to tutorials and rewritten rule books, and we have access to uh, you know years of, of questions and answers. So it's a really good time right now to be getting into this game. So when I first got the game and I had the main thing I had heard was how difficult it was to learn. And so I was a little scared. I was a little apprehensive. And this, this rule book I've heard is one of the worst rule books uh, of all time. I don't think it's that bad. I think you can actually learn the game from this rule book. It just takes some time. One of the hardest things to grasp about Apocrypha is all of the jargon. It uses a ton of different words that, that other games have kind of adopted as, as generic terms, but it changes all of those and it uses its own words for all kinds of things. Just as a really good example, uh, there is a card cost hierarchy and the cost that you have to pay to play cards from your hand, from your saints powers. There are six different ways to discard cards in this game. You can sacrifice them, you can bury them, you can discard them, you can recycle them, you can shuffle them, and you can reload them. And that's in a hierarchy of, of the worst being sacrificed. That means you're putting it back in the box and that card is out of the game. Uh, reloading is the best. You put that card on top of your deck and so your character has a guaranteed chance of drawing that card again on their next turn. So that kind of puts things into perspective, uh, let alone that your, your heroes are called saints and uh, a group of saints is called a choir. Your uh, ability to equip certain things is called slotting into your halo because your, your, your inventory cards will actually be in a position around your character like a halo. So there are lots of things like that. And it's just really important that you learn all of those key words. So here are some tips on learning the game. First, I recommend reading through this whole rule book, even though you may not understand it. 
Uh, but pay special close attention to this page here, the players and the components. You will learn a lot just from this page. As you are reading, pay very special close attention to these orange block uh, text blocks here because these are very detailed gameplay examples and those do explain a lot. And then finally, in the original rulebook, the end, the glossary is incredibly important. It cannot be overstated how important this glossary is because all of these bolded words are keywords and those keywords will be mentioned on cards and mentioned in different powers that you can use and different abilities that you have and different things that you will come across that you will engage with. And every time I came across one of those words, I turned to the glossary and it was in there with a detailed definition of what to do when you encounter that word. This keyword system is really important to the game because it allowed them to, to keep the text on the cards down to a minimum by just relying on these keywords. But that offloaded a lot of the, of the rules information onto the player to memorize things and to know where to find things. So just know how useful that glossary is. The most important rule in the rulebook and the most important thing to keep in mind is to uh, the, the rule that says powers do what they say and don't do what they don't say. Keep that in mind. It's very literal, but it will save your butt a lot in this game. Also, when you have an issue with the game, try to think about what the... Uh, Try to think about what the rule, what the mechanism is doing to foster the thematic quality of this game, because those two elements are very tightly intertwined in this game. To learn the mechanical side of the game, I do recommend a video tutorial on the Off the Shelf Board Game YouTube channel. I'll post links below. It's a very good tutorial. It is uh, very, it, it's long. It's about an hour and a half long. It's no nonsense. The host gets right to it and starts explaining everything about the game in a pretty uh, easy to understand manner. And I really did learn a lot from that video. To learn about the thematic side of the game, how to play this game thematically, because while this is kind of a story based game, the theme does not jump off the table. You're not reading a lot of flavor text. You're not uh, reading through an adventure book or an RPG book or a choose your own adventure style paragraph guide. You do need to think a little bit. You do need to put in some effort to get the thematic quality out of it. And to see a really good example of the thematic side of this game, I recommend the Litching Hours Insanely Detailed playlist where he plays through every mission in this game, all 90 missions. It's it's one of the most detailed, just incredibly detailed uh, Let's Play series I have ever seen. And he gets really into the theme and telling the story and developing the characters. So that is highly recommended. Uh, to, uh, to further bolster your understanding of the rules, of the mechanisms, I also recommend going to BGG and downloading the Junior Devil Bird Guide's Guidebook to the Apocalypse. This is a rewritten rulebook that is also very, very handy, and you shouldn't have any trouble learning the game from this rewritten rulebook. And then finally, my final tip for learning the game is to completely ignore this here, this enter here, this start here tutorial pack of cards. On the rulebook, this says, if this is your first time playing Apocrypha, Find the deck marked with the enter here cards and then go to this website for a video guide on how to play. I do not recommend learning the game in that manner. For one, the cards will really confuse you because you haven't read the rules yet and you'll have no context to what they are and how you should be approaching the game. I think this is a really bad way to learn the game. So just take those decks of cards, take that enter here deck of cards, separate it into your different... Uh, your, your, your different dividers, and then just start from the beginning. The scenario that it walks you through, it's a subset of a scenario. It's like a small snippet of a scenario. And I just don't think it does a very good job of teaching the game. 
and you will learn a lot just by dividing your cards up into where they need to go and learning what the different cards are. So how do you organize everything? So this is everything. This is everything in the game. We have the expansions. We have the cards I am working with now, and we have the cards. We have my my uh, my saint cards, my character cards down here. So on this side here, we have the all of the cards that you will need for these chapters, Golems, Deathless, Fey, and Physicians. Here we have the chapters for Serpents, Dreamers, Damned, and the Animus. And then on this side here, we have all of my Nexus cards. Your Nexus cards are your various places that you will be exploring and trying to purge of evil. We have our death cards here, and these are the cards that will kind of clog up your deck. And if you get too many death cards, your character, your saint is, is, is dead and they're completely out of the game. Here we have all of my fleeting fragments. Fleeting fragments are one-time powers that you can earn for completing missions. And then you can slot these into your halo to gain one-time abilities. We have the missions that I'm currently working on. And uh, we have the structures. The structures is one of the most confusing things about the game. We'll talk a little bit about these in a minute. I do have some nexuses mixed in because I, I kind of have a game kind of saved right now to, uh, to reset up after I make this video. We have all of our threats. And these threats are kind of like the, the, the general uh, bad things that you have to overcome. We have our true threats. True threats are the big bads. These are the, 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 the bosses and their minions that you will have to fight throughout the game. And then we have all of our gifts. And the gifts here, these are things that your saints will encounter that you try to overcome in order to win those gifts and add them to your deck to allow your character to survive longer and to have uh, additional powers. So when you first get your base set, you're going to see a whole bunch of cards that are black bordered with the word base at the bottom. Those are your base cards. Those are all the cards that come in box, box one, the world. Box one, the world comes with kind of two stories and it will come with a storybook. We have the world. So we have the secrets of candle point, which is kind of a tutorials um, campaign. Then we have the book of the skinwalkers. And then the flesh comes with four stories, the book of the deathless, the fae, the golems, and the physicians. And then the book of the devil comes with the book of the animus, the damned, the dreamers, and the serpents. Each one of those stories, each one of those chapters has nine associated missions. So that is 90 different missions, 90 different quests that you can go on in this game. While it might seem like a campaign game, it's really not. You can jump around from any story to the next. Uh, you can go from one mission to the next. You can play most of the missions in any order you want to. There really isn't an order. You're trying to kill. You're trying to stop these nine Novums from taking over the world and ushering in the apocalypse. How you go about that is up to you. So that means that the power creep in this game is kind of kept to a minimum. You know, you're not starting with weak enemies and then ending with strong enemies. The numbers just don't go up in this game. There will be persistent changes to your character, to your saints, and to your choir as you play. And a lot of those changes will actually see them getting weaker because you're collecting too many death cards. So it's kind of an interesting concept. However, a new saint who has never played a single mission should have a viable chance of beating any mission in all of these nine different stories. So it's an in, or 10 different stories. It, it's an interesting concept. Your character will change over time, but it's not just getting bigger numbers. It's not just doing more damage. It's not just uh, preventing damage from coming to you. As your character will get new cards in their deck, the most important thing is you as a player will learn how to play the game better. And so the missions might get a little more complex in what they are expecting out of you, the player. There is a kind of connection between you, the player, and the saint, because the knowledge of you uh, that you have playing the game will actually make your saint more powerful. So that is one thing to keep in mind. The other expansions also come with their own storybooks here. So we have the Flesh Storybook and the Devil Storybook. We'll take a closer look at those in a minute. 
But anyways, back to our base cards. So the base cards in the world in the base box uh, will say base on the bottom and they will have a black border. You're going to use all of those cards in every game you play, regardless of which chapter you are playing. When you play another chapter, you will also mix in all of the associated cards with that chapter with their corresponding base cards. And then you will use those cards whenever you play a mission from that chapter. So while you can jump from one chapter to the next, if you do that, you will have some setup time to remove all of your, your skinwalker cards and uh, in between games and maybe add your fey cards or add your damned cards. You can do that, but it will greatly increase the time. So what I'm doing is I'm going through all of the Skinwalker missions right now. And the Skinwalker chapter is the first kind of real chapter that the base game comes with. And that's where the game really starts to expand. In the storybook here at the beginning, you will have a really nice introduction to the world, how the Novums have divided uh, North America here in the United States into their, their kind of like gang territories. And so you will need to go through... Uh, kind of a tour around the United States, around North America, fighting these Novum and, and trying to stop them from taking over the world. The Book of the Skinwalkers, this is the chapter that I am playing now. And so that chapter will start with an introduction. And then each chapter, after the first, after the candle point kind of tutorial scenario, each chapter will have some new rules to learn. These new rules for each chapter are only in effect when you are playing this chapter. So this chapter here, we have a new thing that we need to keep track of, and that's called lunacy. So when you are playing the Skinwalker uh, missions, you keep track of lunacy. If you switch to another chapter mid Skinwalkers to try something else, this rule would, would not apply to that other chapter. So things are kind of siloed in that way. In the storybook, then you will have these columns and those will tell you how to set up your game. Those will tell you the cards that you need from the various decks, how to lay those out and how the different uh, structures are organized to give you the detailed rules of the, um, of the scenario. And so you will have these various mission cards. So for instance, this is a mission in the Skinwalkers. They'll tell you what the true threats are. Those are the bosses. Those, those are the minions, you, the minions you are trying to defeat. It will tell you certain different powers that you have to keep track of. A power is basically anything that can trigger to make something happen. Saints have powers. Nexuses, places have powers. Threats have powers. Everything has powers. A power is just an ability on a card that will trigger something to happen. But th these are all of the skin walker missions. And when you complete a mission, so if you were going on this loop guru mission and you completed that mission on the back side of that mission is a reward for completing that mission. And that is called an enduring fragment. These are little pieces of story, little snippets, little uh, memories that your character has access to now. And these will add certain powers to your character. And when you get these, you actually slot them in your halo. And that just means add them to your character card in a certain configuration. So you have access to those powers. We'll talk a little bit more about the saints in general in just a moment. But a typical mission will see you going from one place to the next. And the places are called a nexus, nexuses, nexus, I, nex, nexuses. And a nexus will have a doomed side and a hope side. The hope side is usually better for your saint to accomplish their goal, while the doom side is more dangerous. At the bottom of the doom side, all nexuses start with their doomed side up. You will have the cards that you seed in to this location, and those will become the cards that you have to encounter in order to win your mission. In this instance here in the park, you will have uh, one body card, three soul cards, one rage card, three threats, and no omen cards. And so you will take those cards out of the sub decks that you have created. So here are all of my mind cards and you have different virtues. You have mind, body, rage, and soul. And those virtues correspond to different gifts. And the gifts are the things that you will build your character's decks with. And these are the things that will give you powers. These are the things that will allow, allow you to to cleanse and guard the nexuses 
And these are all the things that will allow you to fight all of the evil threats that you have to come up against. And these cards here will all have some art and a little bit of flavor text, and then it'll tell you what you need to do in order to gain this card. If I came across this camera obscura in one of the nexuses and I drew it, I would have to pass a mind test of 10 or a soul test of 13 in order to take this card and add it to my hand. Your cards are also your hit points. So if you are ever told to draw a card and you no longer have cards in your deck, your saint starts to fade. If they fade too much, then they will take a death card and that death card will clog up their halo, allowing them to slot fewer uh, fragments and become less powerful. But to, uh, to pass a test, it's usually pretty easy. You will assemble a pool of dice and so let's say uh, that my uh, saint had a, a, a uh, mind power of four. That would allow me to add four dice, four, four mind dice. The dice match the color of the gift you're trying to get. And uh, let's say that I also had a skill that was a strike one. Well, since my uh, this camera obscura has a matching strike and my strike skill was one, I could add one bonus die. Then I would uh, roll this pool of dice and I would choose the three best dice to get a 10 or higher in order to win that gift and add it to my deck. There are a whole bunch of different ways to mitigate your luck. You can flip dice, you can boost dice, you can add to dice. Sometimes you will have to subtract dice. Sometimes you will have to trash dice. There are a ton of different ways to, to assemble your dice pool and then to evaluate what you do. And that's another really important thing to keep in mind as you are lose as you are losing, <laughs> you will lose the game a lot, but it's a really important thing to keep in mind as you are learning the game, the turn order and how the various uh, uh, phases are titled, uh, how the, what they are called. You have a start phase, any power that has the start keyword, you can play in the start phase and you might do other things at the start phase. A nexus might tell you to do something at the start phase. So whenever you come to each step, each step happens even if you as the player aren't involved in that step because other things might happen in that step. So just keep in mind, work your way down this turn order and also keep in mind that some of these steps can be re repeated multiple times. So then we have the support step. Any card that says support, you can play in that step. The investigate step, after you investigate, that's when you draw a card from your nexus and then you you evaluate that card or not evaluate, that's a keyword, so I don't, don't want to confuse you. You look at that card to determine what you want to do. Do you want to try to, avoid? so you take the card, do you want to avoid it or confront it? Avoiding it will usually mean you shuffle it back into the deck to encounter it later. To confront it means that you're going to assemble a dice pool to try to gain that card or try to defeat that card. And then you have an initiative step, and that's the first thing that happens when you confront. Then you have an act step. You have a target and assist, mutate, assemble, evaluate, terminate, win, or lose. So those are all things that happen as sub steps to the investigation step. After that, you go on to the sanctify step. You go on to the transfer step, which is usually your movement or transferring cards. You're kind of you're transferring your saint from one location to the next, or you're transferring cards from your hand to another saint's hand. And then you go into your end step. So this is there is a lot to keep in mind, a lot of words, but it's very important to keep each one of these in mind and learn what it does. If you can get this down, if you can get the hierarchy of costs down, such as, you know, sacrifice is the worst. If you have a card and it says to sacrifice this card, then that card goes back into the box and it's out of the game. Or if you reload, you will take a card and you will put it back on your Saints deck and then you will be able to use that at a later time. Let's take a look at the Saints here. So let's see, the main saints I am playing as are Dr. Zeus and Ruby Doomsday. Now you can play this game with a single character. It's supposed to be viable to win uh, any of the missions with a single saint, but that is a little limiting because there are a lot of uh, combinations and a lot of ways that the characters can interact with each other. And so I, find, uh, I found that my favorite way of playing was with two different saints. 
So I have Dr. Zeese and Ruby Doomsday. In the base set, you will have enough alpha cards. So alpha cards are the cards that come with the base set that have this symbol at the top. Those are the cards that you will use to build your Saints initial deck. And you have enough to build out about six different Saints. So I put together six Saints that I thought sounded interesting. And these are kind of my stable of Saints that I can build my choirs with as I am playing the game. And you can mix and match. You can retire one or bring one out from retirement. Uh, you don't need to stick with the same Saints from mission to mission. So in my stable, I have Ophelia Willows. I have Leroy Bonneville. I have Alice Moon and Frank Block. We also have Diana Jones, Gabriella Vargas, Sam Yee, Juniper Flowers, Bobak Zach Zakaluzny, uh, River Batiste, Matthew Lockhart, Evangeline Rose, Savannah Proctor, Professor Byron, Israel Diaz, Inner Tubes the Clown. <laughs> it always cracks me up every single time. Um, the Awakened King, and then you have your Saints Divider there. So those are all of the different Saints. Those are all the different characters that you can play. When you first choose a Saint to play, you're going to take your Divider card, and on the back of the Divider card, it'll tell you how to construct your initial deck. So uh, Dr. Zeese here has a Mind of Four, so that means he's always going to have four mind cards in his deck. His initial deck will be made up of Bones, Memory Killer, and two Monsterpedias. But as I gain more gifts through uh, playing, I can substitute these cards out for other cards to kind of tailor my deck. The same goes for all of, all of the other attributes. We have Body, so I have a Body of two. So Dr. Zeese will always have two green cards in his deck. I start with Extra Shot and Extra Picks. I have a Rage of two, so I will always have two Rage cards in my deck with extra razor blades and murder board. And I will always have three soul cards in my deck. Charm bracelet, grifter, and Madame Rue's elixir are the cards that I start with. Sometimes when you get those enduring fragments, those things that you slot into your halo, and just to demonstrate that, when you have your card down on the table, let's say you had some uh, fleeting fragments in your character's deck, you literally put those in a configuration kind of like a binder page. If you were collecting Pokemon cards, uh, you, you could actually play this game with binder pages. And I think they actually sold some official binder pages to, to keep track of this. But this is how your character would be configured on your table. You have your character and then you have your halo of cards. And if you had some death cards, those would also have to be slotted into your halo there. Depending on where these cards are dictates how you can use those cards. So keeping track of your positioning of your cards in your halo and also the position of the attributes and where other people at the table are sitting also matters. Because uh, since my body is to the right of my character card, I can use this stat to assist people who are uh, to my immediate right. I can assist to my immediate left with soul. I can assist myself with rage. I can assist anybody else at my location, at my nexus with, uh, with uh, mind. When you're playing solo and you're playing two, you're kind of always in those positions. Or when you're just playing two characters, you're always to the left and you're always to the right but it is something to keep in mind how you are building your saints and how you are constructing your, um, your, your, your choir in order for you to be able to assist each other in beneficial ways. So that's why I'm kind of playing um, these two characters together so they can help each other. When you assist a saint with, a, um, with, with overcoming a challenge, then that challenge becomes mutated and mutations will add little wrinkles to the challenge. So you can assist a saint at any time. And if I assisted for a soul value of three, that would allow the saint that I am assisting a chance to re-roll soul dice three times. So that's a very powerful ability. However, when you assist a saint, you look at one of these mutation cards and you roll a D6 and you apply that mutation. 
that mutation can, can make the challenge much more difficult or it can make the challenge a lot easier. You never really know. So these add all kinds of wrinkles to the various challenges. And each of the various chapters, each uh, main chapter, comes with its own unique set of mutations that you will mix in with the base mutations when you are playing that chapter. I think this is really cool. It adds a lot of variety to each challenge, and it is a really good pressure luck mechanism for, uh, for mitigating luck. And like I said, there are a lot of different ways to mitigate the luck in this game and a lot of uh, clever card play and clever dice manipulation. There are a lot of times when you get into this game or when I got into this game and when I was playing it where the game made me feel really clever for getting uh, for putting together an interesting combination and overcoming a difficult challenge. But right now I've gone through two missions with these characters. So each one of these characters, so each one of these characters is equipped with one fleeting fragment. Fleeting fragments are less powerful enduring fragments. These get sacrificed when they are used. And again, remember sacrifice means to put back in the box that is out of the game. But right now, Dr. Zeiss, I have a scrapbook. I have a charm bracelet. I have this therapy dog. I love this therapy dog. It's a really good, uh, it's a really good uh, card for healing because healing is really important in this game. When you heal, you, sh you shuffle random cards from your discard deck back into your, your deck ready to be drawn from. I have two Monstropedias, a Grifter, an Extra Shot, Picks, a Runic Blade, and a Murder Board. And then you will always start also with a number of Omens. And these Omens will allow you to investigate Nexuses. And you will, at the beginning of the game, you will generally make a deck of omens as dictated by the structure of the mission. And this deck of omens will become your timer. And at the beginning of every turn, you will draw an omen and then you can use that omen to investigate the location that you are on to try to find the things that you need to find to solve that mission, to solve that quest. There are omens of hope and omens of doom. And just like the nexuses where the doom side is bad for your investigators, for your saints, and the hope side is good for your saints. When you play an omen of hope, something good will happen. When you play an omen of doom, usually something bad will happen. But again, each of the various chapters comes with their own unique omens to mix in with your base cards. So each time you play a new chapter, you have a, a larger deck of omen cards to, to, to choose from. And so each time you play, it's kind of a different setup of cards. When you set up your mission, you are going to set up your structure. And this is one of the most confusing parts because each mission will tell you how to set up your structure, but it's not exactly as clear as it should be. Let's take a look at, let's see, which one was I looking at? I'm going to use these cards as an example. I think I was setting up, was it Loop Guru? So this says that I need to cleanse the gangs wherever there's trouble as the hours pass. So I look for those structure cards and try to create that sentence. So I need to cleanse the gangs. The gangs is not part of it, but the gangs is part of that sentence. So I need to cleanse wherever there's trouble as the hours pass. Your first structure card will give you your goal of that mission. Your second structure card will tell you how you can move from one location to the next. Sometimes you are restricted in your movement. Sometimes you are free to move forever. Your third structure card will tell you how uh, the timer mechanism will work for that particular mission. So just know when you see those. So like, uh, what does it say uh, here? Withstand Sudan wherever there's trouble while danger remains. So I need to find the structure for withstand for wherever there's trouble and danger remains. So that's how you set up your structures. And that's what the structures will tell you. The structures give you more detailed rules on what you need to do to solve that mission. And the gameplay, once you get going, it's not too complicated. You just want to keep in mind your keywords, looking up your keywords, uh, learning how to trigger these powers, learning when they can be played. You also want to keep track of your positioning 
you know, if an arrow is pointing down, it means you. If an arrow is pointing ahead, it means um, another saint at your same location. If an arrow is pointing to the left or right, it means the saint to your left or the saint to your right. If an arrow is pointing in all directions, it means any one saint. If any of those have a circle around them, it means all of the saints in that direction that apply. A uh, burst means the active saint. And then depending on the halo, it's a, uh, the halo there, how you have things slotted in your halo, a saint in the direction that it is slotted, that it is physically put around your character. So yeah, there's a lot to this game. And like I said, it is very thoughtful. You know, you will build out your nexus. You will have a bunch of different cards in your nexus. And then usually you will be taking your standee here. It comes with a whole bunch of standees. You will be moving from one nexus to the next. You will be investigating those cards and then trying to either defeat those cards if they are a threat or uh, defeat these cards and taking them into your hand if it's a gift so your character can get more powerful and so your character can uh, can survive for longer. Because remember, each card in your hand, each card in your deck is also a hit point. So we haven't really taken a look at the threats yet. We have uh, minor threats and not the band, but we have uh, minor threats and major threats, or what do they call that? Uh, true threats. So these are the regular threats. These are just kind of little things that you will have to overcome as you are exploring the Nexus. You might come across werewolves or things in the basement, a cryptid, uh, Terry's there. You might come across a stash and all of these will have to be defeated or else bad things might happen to your saints. And then we also have our true threats and each mission will have a certain number of true threats. These true threat cards, they never get mixed in to your Nexus decks. These are always placed at the top of the table and then they will correspond to your archetype decks. So if you're told to take out minions one, two, and six, I don't know where three is, where's that minion three? So if you're told to take out minions one, two, and three, and you might be told that the matadors are minion one, the griffs are minion two, and the jacks are minion three. You will place those at the top of your table, and then you will shuffle these into the nexuses that the mission tells you to. And then when you draw minion one, you'll refer to a table or your memory and go, oh yeah, okay, so minion one is actually the jacks. So that's also kind of a, a, another little uh, thing that kind of confuses people. I think they use that similar system in Pathfinder. But I, I like this game quite a bit more than Pathfinder. I kind of bounced off Pathfinder. Um, I just didn't feel like it gave me that RPG feel that I was hoping it would. Now, you can play this game as an RPG as well. And the rulebook does have rules for playing with a guide for playing with a GM. I think that could be fun, but I'm not sure. Um, but I have enjoyed my time with this game. I think it is a very thoughtful game. Just looking at all the art. Uh, reading the flavor text is really well written. I like all of the ways that the various elements work together. Once you start learning those keywords and you start learning what the game is asking you is what you start learning what the mechanisms are asking from the theme and how those things correspond and how those things uh, work with each other. The game is not super difficult to learn. I've ha I've had much, much more difficult times <laughs> learning other games, but it does take some time for sure. I think the game can actually be enjoyed by ignoring the theme because there are enough interesting decisions to make. There are clever, uh, clever card play. And I think the mechanisms are strong enough to kind of exist on their own. However, I think the game is more fun if you approach things on a thematic level. The stories aren't very long, but the setup is really cool. And you will learn a lot of things from reading this, uh, reading this initial story and uh, looking at the art on the cards and reading the fragments and reading the little snippets of flavor text. You can start to piece together this really creepy world. And it has kind of gotten under my skin a little bit uh, like Etherfields. This is a game that I have been thinking about while I am uh, while I'm not playing it. It kind of continues to haunt my mind, even when it isn't on the table. And that doesn't happen very frequently. And so just because of that, I think this is a pretty good game. 
but it's not a game where the story elements are going to jump off the table at you. There isn't a lot of story to read. The story is made up more of what happens on the table and by connecting the dots and the world building with the mechanisms. If you want a stronger game with a stronger, more focused narrative with some similar gameplay, Ether Fields might be a better game for you. However, if you want a game like Ether, Ether Fields with more interesting card play and more interesting mechanisms and more freedom in how you interact with everything that you have, then the Apocrypha Adventure card game might be uh, the game for you. But is it worth that uphill battle to learn? And, you know, I don't there are very few games where I start off a, a video with, hey, how should you learn this game? Uh, read the rule book, uh, uh, memorize the glossary, watch an hour and a half YouTube video, download a rewritten rule book, um, ignore the tutorial. There's a lot There's a lot of, of, of ask from the player, but is it worth it? I, I think right now, I think, yes, it is worth it, especially with the price, especially with the clearance price. You can get a whole heck of a lot of game for not a lot of money. And right now we have the benefit of having access to a whole bunch of different resources to learn the game. We have YouTube, we have BGG, we have the years since this game has been released. I think like what, five years? I think it came out in 2017. So we have five, six years of, of FAQ uh, knowledge, of, of knowledge uh, management to, to, to turn to to learn this game. And I do think it is worth it. I've had fun playing solo, but I think the game would work best with two or three or two other players. I think a three choir a three saint choir would be a lot of fun. I don't think I would want to play three saints solo because the turns um, aren't strictly siloed off because of all of that ability to assist other saints who are in your choir. You do need to kind of constantly be thinking about all of the cards in play. And so it can be a lot of information to maintain. However, I would only want to play this game with people who were really sold on the theme, who were into developing their characters as they play, who were into the, the kind of creepiness going on. Because the theme is pretty light and it's not jumping out at you, I could see playing with the wrong people uh, turning this into kind of a slog. So if you can find two other people who are just as in to this kind of... Um, modern contemporary horror with uh with some uh, conspiracy theory and weird cryptid and weird monster stuff going on then you could have a really good time playing this and really getting into the theme learning the mechanisms lear learning how to play uh, learning how to put together creative combinations learning how to assist each other in creative ways and yeah it's a cool game it's a very thoughtful game and it has made me think a lot as I have been developing uh, this review, this video, maybe think about the characters and the stories and the various things that I am encountering. I love looking at at all of the all of the art, I think is really interesting. It's done by a whole bunch of different artists. There are neat things, neat little uh, Easter eggs to discover and little callbacks to to other uh, other properties, but um, each of the chapters seems to be really unique. Each of the stories has new and interesting ways to engage with the things that are in the box. And yeah, it's a cool game. I I'm really happy with uh, buying this this bundle at the discounted price that I got it at. So all right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video of Apocrypha, the adventure card game. Uh, we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.